I'm Al Feldstein. During the past six, seven, maybe even eight years, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to speak to literally hundreds of organizations across the entire state, actually, on the history of Allegheny County. On each of these occasions, I utilized a slideshow, which I developed from my large collection of historic postcard views of Allegheny County. On many occasions, after the presentation, somebody would walk up to me and say, Albie, why don't you develop a video on all this? Well, now I've done it. What you're about to see is a comprehensive depiction of historic Allegheny County sites and scenes for your viewing pleasure and so that you won't have to sit through the whole thing at once if you don't care to, I've divided the county up into five geographic areas. We begin with Cumberland. We then move to LaVale, up to Frostburg, down through George's Creek, and the last segment covers scenes covering the entire Allegheny County. At the beginning of each sequence, there'll be a live action narrative from myself, sort of introducing the area that we're to talk about. On those occasions, you may see me refer to this little blue booklet. This is entitled Feldstein's Illustrated Tour Guide to Historic Sites in Allegheny County. The book features over 80 photographs, a write-up on each historic site, it goes through Cumberland, Mount Savage, LaVale, Frostburg, and George's Creek. This is my latest publication. It only costs $6, and it's available now at a bookstore near you. This was a commercial advertisement. Without any further ado, let's get on with the show, Feldstein's Historic Allegheny County of Video Extravaganza. I want you to learn something and I also want you to enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Okay. We're in the heart of the city of Cumberland, Riverside Park. The park was actually somewhat larger than this at one time but during the $18.5 million construction of the Cumberland Flood Control Project between the years 1949 and 1959, much of Riverside Park was destroyed. The city of Cumberland actually has its genesis going back to October 1749, when Christopher Gist, an agent for the Ohio Company, established a stockade and trading post at the junction of Wills Creek and the Potomac River. Under threat of the upcoming conflicts that would lead to the French and Indian Wars, this stockade became a fort and was named Fort Cumberland after the Duke of Cumberland, who was commander-in-chief of the British forces. It was named Fort Cumberland by General Edward Braddock upon his ri arrival to the site in October 1755. Upon Cumberland's incorporation in 1787, the town took the name of its historic fort, Cumberland. It was for some years prior to that known as Washington Town. The county, Allegheny County, was officially incorporated in 1789 on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1789. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Cumberland. This is an artistic depiction of what Fort Cumberland looked like. It stood approximately on the site currently occupied by Cumberland's Emanuel Episcopal Church. Built in 1755, the fort had all but disappeared by 1840. George Washington's headquarters was erected near the Fort Cumberland Parade Grounds in 1755. The headquarters were relocated in 1844, but donated back to the city in 1921 and placed in Riverside Park. General John J. Blackjack Pershing was a guest at the ceremony. Only a small part of the original log headquarters remains, which served Washington during the French and Indian Wars and later Whiskey Rebellion. 
It was then, on October 18, 1794, as President and Commander-in-Chief, that George Washington made his final appearance in uniform to review the troops. Construction on the City Hall and Academy of Music began in 1874 and was completed with its formal opening on March 7, 1876. The massive building had 18-inch thick walls and a four-foot thick rock foundation. The building was 78 feet high from street to roof crest and 140 feet high to the top of the tower. The ground floor was occupied by a market house that covered 10,000 square feet. Above the ground floor were, were located the beautifully frescoed mayor's office, clerk's office, and council chamber. On March 14, 1910, it was destroyed by fire. The entire south portion of the city hall above the market had been devoted to entertainment and was widely referred to as the Academy of Music, which was considered to have one of the most beautiful interiors in the country. The drop curtain, which enclosed a 30-foot wide by 30-foot deep stage, handsomely illustrated the decline of Carthage. The Academy had a seating capacity of 1,300, but at various times was packed to the walls with over 2,000 people. This magnificent structure was built at a cost of $127,000. In 1896, McMullen Brothers opened their department store in Cumberland. The building featured a white enameled brick front with bricks manufactured in Mount Savage. Remodeled in 1938 and again in 1958, the structure is presently occupied by G.C. Murphy's. But if one looks closely, the white enamel bricks can still be seen on various sections of the building. The Cumberland City Hall was built at a cost of $87,000 in 1911, 1912. It replaced the City Hall Academy of Music building, which burned in 1910. With the cornerstone laid on June 6, 1911, the current City Hall officially opened for business on March 25, 1912, with the initiation of its first City Council meeting. The original plans called for a dome, but at $6,000, the cost was considered too extravagant by city fathers. The interior rotunda features a mural depicting the city's early history, Fort Cumberland, General Edward Braddock, and George Washington. Constructed about 1845 and originally known as the Barnum House, the Windsor Hotel stood on the northeast corner of George and Baltimore Streets in Cumberland. On February 21, 1865, a band of Confederates called the McNeil Rangers captured the Union General Benjamin F. Kelly, who was asleep in his bed in the hotel. McNeil's Rangers were young men from Cumberland and nearby counties in West Virginia. Upon Kelly's capture, he was sent to Richmond, Virginia as a prisoner. But after the war, Kelly returned to Cumberland, married, and remained here until his death in 1891. The hotel was demolished in 1959, and the site is now occupied by the Liberty Bank Drive-In. One of the popular restaurants in Cumberland during the 1920s and 1930s was the White Palace, located within the Windsor Hotel. Looks a little like McDonald's, doesn't it? The Allegheny County Courthouse was constructed during the years 1893, 1894. It was designed and built under the supervision of local architect Wright Butler. Butler also designed the Masonic Temple and Liberty Bank Building. Located on Prospect Square, the cornerstone for the courthouse was laid on October 5, 1893, and the building was constructed at a cost of $97,000. Additions to the courthouse were later made in 1916 and 1925. 
Built in the Richardson Romanesque style, the courthouse is three stories high with a steep hip roof and a tower buttressed with round columns. A polychrome effect is achieved by the contrast of the brick walls with stone trim. The Potomac Glass Company opened for production in 1904. It was located behind the present-day Algonquin Motor Inn along the banks of Wills Creek and the tracks of the West Virginia Central Railroad. The Potomac Glass Company employed almost 350 people before it burned down on April 25, 1929 at a cost exceeding $150,000. Fire also claimed the Wellington Glass Factory. The Wellington Company was officially organized in 1909 and occupied the plant previously used by the Cumberland Glass Works and its successor, the National Glass Company. This plant, built in 1884, was located at the far western end of North Mechanic Street and burned down on February 29th 1920 at a loss of over four hundred thousand dollars in april 1893 a lot was purchased on baltimore street for twelve thousand dollars and on july 31st 1893 a cornerstone was laid for the young men's christian association of cumberland building the original structure was three stories high and elevator equipped. The first floor was rented out. Offices, game rooms, and a library were on the second floor, while a gymnasium and balcony running track occupied the third. The Y formally opened on May 15, 1894. In 1910, a major remodeling added two additional stories and 30 dormitory rooms. The site is now occupied by Peskins. The Cumberland YMCA vacated the earlier site and after securing temporary quarters, occupied its present edifice at the eastern tip of Baltimore Street on January 31, 1926. The first National Bank building was constructed in 1912. This institution was originally chartered in 1811 as the Cumberland Bank of Allegheny County and the first bank in Cumberland, a city of 600 people. In 1833, the bank was reorganized and in 1864, the bank was chartered as the first National Bank of Cumberland. Chartered in 1865, the second National Bank of Cumberland, located in 1868 to the corner of Baltimore and South Liberty Streets. The magnificent building located on this spot was constructed in 1890 and is now occupied by the first National Bank of Maryland. The edifice was designed by the notable architect and Cumberland native, Bruce Price. Price also happens to be the father of Emily Post of Etiquette fame. This unique building has a rounded Spanish-type tile-covered roof. The structure mixes the Byzantine Revival style with a strong, round-arched Romanesque influence in the treatment of its windows and doorway. The Queen City Savings Bank was incorporated in 1872. With a national charter in 1879, the bank merged into the Third National Bank of Cumberland. It was Third National which erected the six-story red brick structure in about 1901-1902. The building was designed by Cumberland architect Wright Butler and represents downtown Cumberland's earliest skyscraper. In 1920, a major merger consolidated the Citizens National Bank, Third National Bank, Citizens Savings Bank, and Dime Savings Bank. This created the Liberty Trust Company, which was chartered in January 1920. Liberty Trust was then the largest financial institution in Maryland outside of Baltimore. On October 9th, 1984, 
the name was changed to Liberty Bank, the present occupant. Construction on the Queen City Station Hotel began in 1871 and was completed in November of 1872. It was built at a cost of more than $300,000 by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. On the ground floor of the central portion of the hotel, there was a 400-seat dining room, which was often used for magnificent socials and ballroom dancing. The actual station facility was located on the ground floor of the north wing. In the basement were game rooms, storage areas, and a fully equipped laundry. The hotel had nearly 150 guest rooms, and the entire building was heated by steam. Named the Queen City Hotel in recognition of Cumberland's position as the Queen City of the Potomac, this building gave credence to the importance of Cumberland as a major junction of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company. But the glories of the past were not sufficient to save this building. After the failure of a two-year campaign to preserve and maintain the hotel, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad commenced demolition of the Queen in the fall of 1971. The Queen City Station Hotel was located in Cumberland, just west of Park Street, south of East Harrison Street, and east of the B&O tracks. The site is currently occupied by the new U.S. Postal Facility. On August 1, 1903, the Western Maryland Railroad Company broke ground for its Cumberland Extension. Begun at a site just west of Big Pool, Maryland, it would take 23 bridges and five tunnels before the 60-mile line was completed to Cumberland in 1907. Soon afterwards, the railroad collapsed into receivership but emerged in 1910 as the Western Maryland Railway. Our Western Maryland Railway Station opened on July 27, 1913. The company prospered for years, but by the late 50s, declining revenues began necessitating the elimination of facilities and passenger service. By 1973, the Western Maryland had become a subsidiary of the B&O, C&O Railroads. In 1976, all Western Maryland dispatchers were transferred to the B&O's Cumberland office, and the structure abandoned until 1983 when restoration began. The station now houses several museums, the c Canal Visitor Center, Tourism Office, and Allegheny Central Railroad Office. Virginia Avenue was as important a commercial and business center to South Cumberland as Baltimore Street was to downtown Cumberland. To serve South Cumberland, the Maryland Avenue streetcar line was placed into operation in September 1891. Streetcar lines would continually expand along Virginia Avenue, eventually reaching Mary Street, until August 24, 1930, when buses replaced streetcar service on Virginia Avenue. Sources state that the first B&OY on Virginia Avenue was in operation as far back as 1888. On January 8, 1900, the Utah House opened on Virginia Avenue. The building contained 31 bedrooms, a restaurant, pool room, and bar. In May 1905, the B&O Railroad purchased the Utah House, and it was henceforth known as the B&O Railroad YMCA. Closed in 1967 and now gone, the site is currently a parking lot for Dick and Clara's restaurant. The Cumberland Savings Bank was organized in 1899 and originally located on the corner of Virginia and Lang Avenues. This was at a time of intense industrial activity in South Cumberland, and in 1904, a new facility, the bank building depicted in this photograph, was constructed on the corner of Virginia Avenue at the B&O Railroad crossing. 
the Art Deco style building was constructed at a cost of $4,000. The Masonic Temple Cornerstone was laid on June 6, 1911. This magnificent edifice was built at a cost of about $75,000 and completed and dedicated on November 12, 1912. The building was designed by local architect Wright Butler. The interior features ceiling and wall paintings throughout, which were done by artists from Cumberland's own Dubrow Art Studio. Elaborately carved ceremonial chairs, desks, and altars and other furniture were made by HUF Floor Shuts and Son, local manufacturers of fine furniture. Freemasonry in Allegheny County can be traced back to November 1816 when the first lodge was established in Cumberland. Many people ask, why did all these buildings burn down? Ladies and gentlemen, a 1915 view of Cumberland's Central Fire Department. The Allegheny County Hospital for the Insane, also known as the Alms House on Little Valley Road, was enlarged as the county home. It eventually became known as Sylvan Retreat and was raised in the late 1970s. The old Allegheny Hospital was founded in March 1905. The 25-bed hospital was established on Decatur Street, largely through the efforts of local physician Dr. Edwin Claybrook. In June 1911, the Daughters of Charity took over the hospital's administration and tripled the size of the facility the following year. In 1936, the hospital began construction of a five-story annex, and in May 1937, Archbishop Michael Curley dedicated the new addition. It was in 1952 that the name was changed from Allegheny to Sacred Heart Hospital. Because of an eventual lack of space for expansion, plans began to be made in 1957 for a new hospital site. On a 25-acre site on Haystack Mountain in 1964, groundbreaking ceremonies for a new Sacred Heart Hospital took place. On March 28, 1967, the first patients for the new hospital were admitted. The Western Maryland Hospital was built during the 1890s and located on Baltimore Avenue. One of its major functions was to serve the victims of railroad accidents. It remained a hospital until the facilities were moved and the name changed to Memorial Hospital, which had been built in 1927-1928. At the time it burned down in 1973, the old Western Maryland Hospital was known as the Allegheny Inn. The new hospital, the current hospital, was dedicated on August 18th 1929, with Thomas B. Finan, chairman of the Board of Governors, presiding. The nurses' home was constructed also about 1929 and served until the nursing program was transferred to Allegheny Community College in 1972. The structure is now a medical office building. The German Brewing Company, Incorporated, was established in March 1901 with brewing operations initiated on March 8th of that year. The company would undergo several name changes over the years. With America's entry into World War I in 1917, the name was changed to the Liberty Brewing Company. During Prohibition, from 1920 till 1933, the company sold a cereal type beverage under the name of Quino Company, and in 1933, at Prohibition's end, the original name, German Brewing Company, was reinstated. In 1941, the name of the brewery was changed to the Queen City Brewing Company, and it remained such until the brewery's closure in 1974. 
In 1873, Thomas Footer began a small dyeing and cleaning business. In 1904, he undertook a major expansion and constructed a series of large buildings on South Mechanic and Howard Streets. At its peak, the Footer Dye Works employed over 500 people, had offices in 20 cities, and was receiving lace curtains from the White House for cleaning. The Dye Works closed in July 1937 due to general economic conditions and the proliferation of dry cleaning establishments. Footer's motto was, cleanliness is next to godliness. The Kelly Springfield Tire Company, located in Cumberland, due in large part to the efforts and vision of local businessmen working together as the Cumberland Development Company. With the support of local citizenry, this group pledged in 1916 to raise the sum of $750,000 to help locate a Kelly plant in Cumberland. Construction began the following year in 1917, and the plant was completed in 1920, with the first tire being produced on April 2nd, 1921. Though Kelly's corporate headquarters remains in Cumberland, the plant closed and production ceased in 1987. A general view of the Selenese plant shortly after its completion in 1924. Until its closing in 1983, the Cumberland Selenese plant produced one of the seven major chemical fibers in the textile industry. At one time, it is said that this plant employed over 10,000 people. Cumberland's first post office was a log structure situated on North Mechanic Street just beyond the viaduct near Blue Spring. Built in 1791, it was occupied in 1809 by postmaster Samuel Smith. The Allegheny County Office Building was constructed in 1932 and originally served the community as a United States Post Office and Courthouse. The building was designed by Cumberland architect Robert Holt Hitchens, the same man who designed the new Bell High School in Frostburg in 1939. During the 1936 flood, water reached a height of over 10 feet on South Mechanic Street, and the building's first floor was underwater. The city water works began operation in September 1871. The building was located on Green Street near Johnson Street and pumped water from the Potomac River for city use until the development of Lake Gordon in 1913. The office building still remains and once served as the first free public library, as well as Girl Scout headquarters, Senior Citizen Center, and present-day Carpenters Local 1024 Union Hall. The Frederick Street Post Office and U.S. Courthouse was constructed during 1902-1904 and at a cost of $125,000. The cornerstone was laid on November 27, 1902, and the building was dedicated on July 30, 1904. Its architectural style mixes beaux arts and Romanesque with elements of classic revival. The post office and courthouse relocated to Pershing Street in 1932, and in 1934, the building was bought by the city for use as a police station. It currently serves as the Cumberland Senior Citizen Center. City Hall Plaza, 1910. In 1979, Old Number One, the Cumberland Central Fire Department building, located in the middle, was torn down. On the far right is the Bell Tower building. This was the first building in Cumberland constructed specifically to serve as a police headquarters and jail. The Bell Tower building was erected in 1885 at a cost of $2,792.13 and served as the city jail until 1936. 
It has a small square wooden bell tower of which there is no evidence of a bell having ever hung. On July 31, 1973, the building was purchased from the city for $1 by the Chamber of Commerce and now serves as home to the Allegheny County Chamber of Commerce. This photograph shows the interior of the ST Little Jewelry Store in Cumberland. The photo was taken in about 1914. Notice the elegant interior, complete with potted palms, painted ceiling, and lead glass windows. Established in 1851 by Samuel T. Little, Little's was located at 113 Baltimore Street in a building constructed in 1904. At the time of its closing in 1986, the ST Little jewelry business had been in operation for 135 years. The site is now occupied by Barnes Jewelers. HUF Florschutz & Son was a major Cumberland area furniture manufacturer. Much of the firm's handiwork can be seen in the Cumberland City Hall Council Chamber as well as the Masonic Temple. The firm was in existence from 1875 until the late 1950s. Its location on Center Street is the current home of the Book Center. Metro Close opened in 1932 and was originally located in the basement of the old Olympia Hotel on the northwest corner of Baltimore and North Mechanic Street. In 1937, the owner relocated across the street and extensively remodeled this building, which had been constructed prior to 1900. After 53 years of operation, Metro Close closed in November 1984. The building was raised during the summer of 1990. Sussman and Simon Rosenbaum formed the firm of Rosenbaum Brothers in 1878. Their department store was to become one of the largest between Pittsburgh and Baltimore. At one time, Rosenbaum Brothers employed over 200 people. Their second and final location was this magnificent four-story, 10,000-square-foot building on Baltimore Street. Bay windows trimmed in stone, human-like sculptures on the keystones, and lion's heads along the roof line comprise some of the most decorative details. This building was constructed in about 1897-1898 and formally opened on April 24, 1899. Rosenbaum's eventually closed in 1973. On April 28, 1986, the building was rededicated and occupied by First Federal Savings Bank of Western Maryland. The Fort Cumberland Hotel was constructed in 1916 and held its grand opening in January 1918. It was built by the Cumberland Hotel Company at a cost of over $250,000. The Fort Cumberland Hotel exemplifies early 20th century hotel architecture. The structure is ornated with elements of the classically inspired Renaissance revival. Flower drops, floral arrangements, and mermaids decorate the upper stories. In recent years, the hotel was converted to permanent housing and became known as the Cumberland Arms. If one looks to the right of this view, you can see the Liberty Movie Theater, one of the numerous movie theaters which at one time served downtown Cumberland. Downtown Baltimore Street, 1914. The center building is Schwarzenbach and Son. Born in Germany, George Schwarzenbach immigrated to America and then Cumberland in 1869. His first clothing store was on North Center Street. After several locations, he eventually constructed and occupied this magnificent 
four-story edifice located on the north side of Baltimore Street. The building was designed by local architect Wright Butler in 1911 and built in 1912. The Schwarzenbach and Sun building features a bold mansard roof and contains elements of the Beaux Arts classicism style which originated in France. An early business motto was the store with a conscience. A later Schwarzenbach motto read a good store in a good town. The Maryland Theater opened on November 10, 1907. It was one of the premier playhouses in Western Maryland and at the time of its construction had the largest stage in the state. The great Udini opened his first road show here in 1925. Other legendary performers who appeared here include Al Jolson, the Marx Brothers, Eddie Foy, George M. Cohan and Lillian Russell, as well as stage presentations such as Ben-Hur and Madam Butterfly. The Maryland Theater showed its last movie on October 12, 1963. It was raised in 1964 and is now the site of the municipal parking lot on North Mechanic Street. The Algonquin Apartment Hotel was constructed in 1926 and officially opened on October 28th of that year. When opened, the Algonquin boasted of 33 hotel apartments, completely equipped including maid service. About 1936, the hotel was remodeled and the apartments converted to hotel rooms. After 60 years of operation, the Algonquin would eventually close its doors in early July 1986. After extensive renovation, the facility reopened as the Kensington Algonquin, a senior citizen housing facility. The grand opening was held on October 29, 1989. Prospect Square, Washington Street, about 1921. An earlier view of Washington Street looking east. Washington Street, 1907. And as the postcard reads, this is the most aristocratic street in Cumberland. In 1855, Jonathan Magruder built the original two-story structure known today as the Women's Civic Club. The site belonged to David Lynn, an American Revolutionary War officer whose estate stretched from the Potomac River to the Narrows. Lynn's daughter, Mary, was the wife of Jonathan, and she inherited this site in 1853. Their daughter, Rebecca, married one George Henderson, who was superintendent of the Cumberland Coal and Iron Company. In 1868, George purchased the building from his father-in-law and turned the property over to his wife, Rebecca. She was a socially prominent woman, and she initiated the construction of an addition which engulfed the original structure. This house, located at 108 Washington Street, was constructed in about 1865 by William Walsh. An Irish immigrant, William Walsh served two terms in the United States Congress, holding office in the House of Representatives. One of his grandchildren, who was born in this house, was Bishop James Edward Walsh. It was this Bishop Walsh who was convicted and imprisoned as an American spy in the People's Republic of China from 1958 to 1970. Allegheny County purchased the home in 1936 for offices of the Allegheny County Board of Education. 
Josiah Hans Gordon was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates in 1859. It was at an emergency meeting of the state legislature in September 1861 in Frederick where the question of secession was to be voted on that Josiah was arrested by federal troops and imprisoned. Gordon later served as president of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company. Josiah Gordon constructed the Second Empire-style residence at 218 Washington Street in 1867. In 1954, this per property was purchased by the Allegheny County Historical Society. It is today known as History House. The Dingle Bus represents the first such transit service within the city. Operations began in May 1914, and the route ran from City Hall to the developing Dingle area. The cost per ride was only five cents. Pennsylvania Avenue, 1907. Building the new pump house at Ridgedale Reservoir on Gephardt Drive, 1922. Route 48, soon to be designated Interstate 68, now passes through the area on the left. Arch Street, South Cumberland, 1908. Baltimore Avenue. The home on the right was the former residence of Mayor Dr. Thomas W. Kuhn. Columbia Street, early 1900s. Riverside Park, Cumberland on Green Street. Much of this area was removed during the construction of Cumberland's flood control project between the years 1949, 1959. Chemical Company number two, the Browning Street Fire Wagon in South Cumberland, about 1908, I believe. 1920, Green Street. The building on the left is now the George Upchurch Funeral Home. Decatur Street, the Kite Funeral Home now occupies the building on the left. The flood of March 29, 1924 inflicted $4 million worth of destruction in the city of Cumberland alone. Extraordinary damage occurred along the entire north branch of the Potomac River. The towns of Westernport and Luke, as well as the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company and newly developed Selenese plant all suffered. The 1924 flood was also responsible for the CNO Canal's final termination of operations. This is Baltimore Street looking east from the Western Maryland Railroad tracks. The Western Maryland Railroad Yards, those stacks in the background are from the Potomac Glass Company. Baltimore Street, corner of North Center at 1.30 p.m. March 29, 1924. That's Charles Holtzman's drugstore on the corner, by the way. The standard gasoline station on Mechanic Street at the corner of Market. Baltimore Street. Notice the old Olympia Hotel. By the way, these photos once again are from the 1924 flood. The Great Flood of 1936 hit on March 17th and was henceforth known as the St. Patrick's Day Flood. The entire county suffered the flood's consequences. This is Baltimore Street looking west, cleaning up after the flood. Wills Creek along Mechanic Street. South Mechanic Street. North Mechanic Street. Those are 20,000 gallon storage tanks from the American Oil Company. One of these would eventually fall into the creek. 
a great fear was that one of these gasoline tanks would explode. Notice how everybody just sort of walked out onto the Valley Street Bridge to see the explosion. Through the Narrows. Notice the downed telephone poles and tracks washed into Wills Creek. The Market Street Bridge. South Mechanic Street, the water rushed down in a torrent and reached a level of almost 10 feet on Mechanic Street. The corner of Baltimore and South Mechanic Streets. Railroad cars washed down Wills Creek and crashed into the walls and some of the homes on North Mechanic. Notice the watermark on the right. The sender of this postcard writes, We live just up the street from the Valley Street Bridge. I have never seen so much water and refuse. It was like an ocean. I prayed all night our home would still be here in the morning. The flood of October 15, 1942 produced one of the last really significant deluges within Cumberland. Over 300 persons required shelter, and downtown was flooded to a depth of four to five feet. City Hall Plaza is depicted in this photograph from the corner of Bedford and Center Street. A great fear was the Baltimore Street Bridge would wash away. Naturally, once again, everybody came out to see the disaster. Baltimore Street the old Embassy Theater. As a side note, the Embassy, known as the Theater of the Stars, held its grand opening on November 18, 1931, and was constructed at a cost of over $40,000. It is Cumberland's premier example of the Art Deco architectural style. The 420-seat theater closed in 1957. St. Patrick's Catholic Church was constructed between the years 1849-1851. The parish was founded in 1790 and originally known as St. Mary's. With the new church, the name was changed to St. Patrick's. This was due to the influx of Irish into the parish who had come west with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad which reached Cumberland in 1842. The church was dedicated on June 11, 1883 by Archbishop, later Cardinal, James Gibbons. Parishioners from George's Creek came by train for the ceremony. Until 1867, interior lighting was provided by windows and candles. Gas lighting was then installed with electrification in the early 1900s. Carroll Hall was constructed in 1903. The building originally served as a social and sports center and also housed the Carroll Club, whose membership was open to all citizens. The club dissolved during the early 1920s, most likely because of prohibition, and went on to house the LaSalle Institute from 1924 until 1966. Carroll Hall was raised during the late 1980s. The German-speaking Evangelical Lutheran Congregation began construction on the Town Clock Church located on Bedford at High Street in 1848. The structure was dedicated on March 17, 1850. Tradition states that the name Town Clock stems from an offer by the city of Cumberland to supply a town clock to the church tower completed first by either the German Lutherans or the German Catholics at St. Peter and Paul's. The Lutheran women held torches for their men to work by night in order to complete the steeple and win the competition. On June 25, 1927, the original congregation, the St. Luke Congregation, relocated, and in 1931, the edifice became the first Christian church. 
Center Street Methodist Church had its cornerstone laid in 1871 with the church officially dedicated in 1874. Additions were made in 1912 and 1929. The site of St. Peter and Paul's Catholic Church was selected in 1848 by St. John Newman, a superior of the Redemptorist priests. John Newman was America's first male saint recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. The cornerstone for the church was laid in June 1848, and the church completed in 1849. The monastery, paralleling Fad Street, was constructed approximately between the years 1850-1852, with an adjoining section of the monastery built between 1855-1857. The Redemptorists occupied the church until 1866 when they left Cumberland. The monastery then became home to an order of friars from Bavaria called the Carmelites. The Capuchin Friars arrived in 1875 and used the monastery as a training center until 1968. The cornerstone for St. Peter and Paul's Chapel was laid on September 1, 1888. The chapel was completed in 1889 and built onto the eastern end of the monastery. It was cloistered for men only and constructed at a cost of $8,000. In 1902, street excavation necessitated that a massive stone wall be built to protect the friar garden against landslides. The Great Wall of Cumberland was constructed at a cost of $10,674.79. At its tallest point, the wall was 31 feet high and 15 feet thick. The site for First Presbyterian Church was purchased in August 1870 for the sum of $5,000. Construction was most likely initiated in 1871 and completed in 1872. The official church dedication would take place several years later on June 6, 1875. The cost of the original church building was $47,035. The spire was added in 1892. Emmanuel Parish was founded in 1803. The present church site was acquired in 1829 and initially occupied by a plain brick structure. The current stone Gothic Revival Emanuel Episcopal Church cornerstone was laid in May 1849 with the consecration being held on October 16, 1851. It had cost $12,000 to erect a manual church. The parish hall was constructed in 1901. In that same year, the entire property was enclosed by the existing stone wall. The church stands on the site of Fort Cumberland. Cumberland's Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church was organized in 1837. The first AME church was built by freed slaves in 1848 on Frederick Street Extended, then the edge of town. The AME church was then rebuilt in 1871. In 1883, the first story of a new church, the current edifice, was built and dedicated with a second story added in 1892. The work was done by congregational members, friends, and freed slaves. Maryland had emancipated its slaves on November 1st, 1864. By 1880, 1,531 free blacks lived in the county. The first St. Paul's Lutheran Church was known as the Evangelical Lutheran Congregation. Its location was on the corner of what are now Baltimore and North Center Streets. Construction of a second church on the same spot began in 1842 and was completed two years later. 
This church was known as Christ's Lutheran Congregation. On June 25, 1893, the congregation decided to build yet another church on the same spot. This church, as photographed here, was dedicated on September 22, 1895. It was eventually raised about 1957 or 1958 and was replaced by the current St. Paul's Lutheran Church on the corner of Smallwood and Washington Streets. The earliest record of Jewish citizenry in Cumberland can be traced back to 1816. By 1853, 12 Jewish families had taken residence in this growing city of 6,150 people. It was this small group which applied to the Maryland General Assembly for an act creating the Be'er Chaim Well of Life Congregation on May 23, 1853. Steps were taken in 1865 to acquire a site for a Jewish temple, and in 1867, the temple was constructed at the corner of South Center and Union Streets at a cost of $7,427.02. The synagogue was dedicated on March 2nd, 1867. Weekly dues of 25 cents offerings and help from other communities paid the construction cost. The present St. Mark's Reformed Church, located at the corner of Harrison and Park Streets, had its cornerstone laid on July 21, 1912, and was dedicated on Palm Sunday, March 16, 1913. By the way, that's a trolley car in front from the Cumberland Electric Railway Company. Streetcars ran in Cumberland from 1891 up to 1932. By the turn of the century, the tremendous growth in South Cumberland's Catholic population warranted a new parish. On September 9, 1900, a cornerstone was laid for a new church, and on January 27, 1901, St. Mary's Catholic Church, the one depicted in this photograph, was officially dedicated. On December 12, 1903, the church school was opened. In 1905, a steeple was added, and in 1910, a high school was added to St. Mary's. By the 1920s, the need for a larger church was foreseen, and on May 21, 1928, the cornerstone for the present St. Mary's Catholic Church was laid. The first mass held in the new, the Kern Church, which was built at a cost of $216,000, was held on Christmas Day, 1928. The first public school in Allegheny County was incorporated in 1798 and popularly referred to as the Allegheny Academy. Between 1849 and 1850, a new Greek revival style school was built at a cost of $5,000 and the Allegheny Academy located to this site with the official opening on June 8th. 1850. After 131 years, the Allegheny Academy closed in 1929, and in 1934, this building was leased in perpetuity by the Allegheny County Commissioners to the Cumberland Free Public Library. On June 19, 1934, the library was officially opened by Maryland Governor Albert C. Ritchie and in 1960, the name was officially changed to the Allegheny County Public Library. Built in 1912, Columbia Street School was the oldest elementary school in continuous use in Cumberland. 
It now serves the community as an apartment complex. The Cumberland Street School, built about 1898, was used originally to serve high school students who at that time were overcrowding the Union Street School. It served in this capacity from 1899 until 1908. The Cumberland Street School was replaced as a high school in 1908 with the building of Allegheny County High School, which was located on the corner of Green and Lee Streets on the current site of the Coca-Cola Bottling Works and Green Street Chevron Station. After the opening of the present Allegheny High School at Campobello in 1926, the old school became Green Street Junior High and served in that capacity until March 1932 when the three-story structure was destroyed by an early morning fire. The present Allegheny High School had its cornerstone laid on October 28th 1925 and officially opened on September 7, 1926. Penn Avenue School was constructed in 1909. The original school consisted of only eight classrooms and served elementary school children. Additions to the school were made in 1915, 1917, and in 1924 when a new building connected by an auditorium was constructed. Enlargements followed in 1927, and Penn Avenue served elementary, junior, and senior high students. In 1936, the Pennsylvania Avenue High School graduated its largest class. This consisted of 108 students. It was also in June of that year that the school closed. In the fall of 1936, the official opening of the recently completed Fort Hill High School took place. Before the advent of VCRs, suburban indoor malls, and advanced transportation technology, it was not uncommon for homecoming parades, such as these views of one in 1912, to occupy a vast community interest and participation. Baltimore Street, in preparation for the 1912 homecoming parade. Labor union members marched around the Footers Dye Works Arch, which had been constructed for the parade by non-union workers. That's the commercial bank building in the background. The Lewis Stein Funeral Home Float. Notice the trolley car tracks in the middle of the road on Baltimore Street. Electrical Workers Union number 307. The Labor Day Parade of 1908, the Footers Dye Works Float. The Crystal Laundry, our motto, we wash everything but the baby. McMullen Brothers, tireless toilers for trade was their motto. And the Lewis Stein Funeral Home Float, posed in front of the old city hall and academy of music, which would burn to the ground two years later. 1907, Fire Company on Parade. By the way, the poster on the right advertises that Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and Rough Riders of the World Spectacular will be appearing in Cumberland this September. Finally, some early views of Baltimore Street. This one, possibly from the late 1890s. Looking east, 1908, from the Emanuel Episcopal Church. See the spire on the right? That's from the old St. Paul's English Lutheran Church. By the way, the uh, Cumberland House restaurant is on that site now. F.W. Woolworth, five and 10 cent store. 
And just west of that, the G.C. Murphy Company 5 and 10 cents store. At one time, Sears Roebuck and Company was downtown. Burton's menswear was located further down the street. Holtzman's Drug Store, the People's Clothing Store, Ford's Pharmacy, the Julian Goldman Store, Curtis's Confectionery, People's Drug Store, the Fort Cumberland Hotel, the Algonquin Public Service Department Store, Embassy Theater, and so, so many others. Looks like they're just putting up the sign on top of the Fort Cumberland, doesn't it? 1906. What a wonderful year to have been stuck in Cumberland. Long may she wave. I'm standing high atop the Narrows. Behind me and to my left is the gateway to the entrance to La Vale. In 1909, a realtor by the name of David P. Miller purchased a half mile strip along the National Road to use as a real estate development. He gave that tract of land the name La Vale after his birthplace and homestead in Pennsylvania. Although the name La Vale just pertained to that strip of land, popular usage soon carried that name to apply to the entire area. It wasn't until 1947, however, that the Maryland State Legislature created the LaValle Sanitary Commission. In that year, LaValle's boundaries were fixed to parallel Election District 29, and a post office was established to serve the dozen or so communities which comprised this new area. Stagecoaches, inns, and tavern stands lined the area that we know today as LaValle upon the national roads rerouting through the Narrows in about 1834. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you LaValle. The Narrows is a 1,000 foot high natural landmark which cuts through Wills and Haystack Mountains. The pass facilitated commerce, travel, and migration between Cumberland and the West. Early roads bypassed the Narrows and followed the Delaware Indian Nemecolans Path, a trail blazed in 1752 for the Ohio Company over the steep mountain passes to the south. This later became Braddock's Trail and was used in 1755 by General Edward Braddock on his way to the disastrous defeat at Fort Duquesne. It was a Braddock lieutenant who found the Narrows, and a portion of Braddock's army actually used it. Originally, the National Road also followed the mountain passes to the south. After 1832, the federal government rerouted the highway through the Narrows. Abutments from the old stone bridge used from 1834 until 1932 to carry the National Road over Wills Creek can be seen downstream from the present bridge crossing. After more than a century's service as the main westward route, the Narrows is being bypassed again as U.S. Route 48, soon to be I-68, generally follows Nema Colon's path west out of Cumberland. This is the Narrows Park in 1897. The park was connected to Cumberland by a trolley line that was completed by the Cumberland Electric Railway in 1891. The site is now occupied by various commercial enterprises. The Wills Mountain Inn was a private club owned and operated by John Henry Holshue, a Cumberland businessman and realtor. The grand opening of the inn, which was located atop the Narrows, was held on July 20, 1899. 
Originally used as the Elks Clubhouse, it had wide porches on three sides. There were 46 bedrooms with private bath and shower, as well as a billiard room and a grand ballroom. It was later converted to a sanatorium. At the sanatorium, patients paid from $25 to $40, depending on room location. $40 rooms included a private bath. Friends of patients were also accommodated at rates of three to five dollars per day. The building was destroyed by fire in 1931. In 1803, a 348-acre tract called Promised Land was patented by the state to one of Cumberland's original families. It was here in 1834 that the Four Mile House was constructed as an inn along the National Road. The term Mile House stems from the approximate distance to the center of Cumberland. Now a private residence on the National Highway, the vicinity was once known as Long Maryland and served by a post office, mill, and water-powered dynamos producing electricity. Recognize it? This is Route 40, the National Road heading west through Lavelle. The houses are still there, by the way, but the tracks of the Cumberland and Western Port streetcar line are long gone since this photo was taken in the early 1900s. This was the best road between Cumberland and Frostburg. The Five Mile House, as seen in this 1909 view, still stands along the National Road in Lavelle and was one of the famous inns which hosted travelers on their way west. It was originally known as the People's Park, but would later gain area fame as Crystal Park. During the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, this amusement and recreation area would attract hundreds of people daily. Bingo booths, picnic pavilions, a restaurant, miniature railroad, 60-foot high chair plane, zoo, and what was built at one time as the largest merry-go-round in the country were some of its main features. Another top draw was the crystal ballroom, which at times was used for dancing, roller skating, and night clubbing. Just some of the big bands which appeared at the ballroom were Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, Stan Kenton, Gene Koopa, Lawrence Welk, Kay Kaiser, and Cab Calloway. I remember the Crystal Ballroom in its final years when it served as Albert's Market. At the time, prior to its redevelopment, the site was also home to the Crystal Drive-In Movie Theater. This area, located in LaVale, is now roughly occupied by Goldsmith Black, Pull Folks Restaurant, and McDonald's. Maintaining the National Road and constitutional questions regarding the right to charge a toll resulted in the federal transfer of ownership of the National Road to the states. Maryland accepted her section in 1835. The two-story, seven-sided, Tollgate House was completed in 1836. This was the first toll house within Maryland's section of the National Road. Maryland collected tolls until 1878 when the road and toll house became county property. The county collected tolls on the road until about 1900. In 1807, Gerard Clary, purchased 335 acres on a site known as Hope and Prospect. It was in that same year he constructed the Clarysville Inn, which for many years was known as the Eight Mile House. Located on the National Road, the main route of travel between Baltimore and Wheeling, West Virginia, the inn prospered for many years as a tavern, stage house, and wagon stand. The Clarysville Inn is also noted for having served as a convalescent hospital for Union forces during the Civil War. 
numerous hospital buildings and wards surrounded the Clarysville Inn at that time. The impetus to develop the National Road was first initiated in 1806 by Thomas Jefferson. That same year, construction of the Cumberland, or National Road, was authorized by Congress. Construction began at Cumberland in 1811 and was completed to the Ohio River at Willing in 1818-1819. This section is the nation's first and only wholly federally funded and constructed road. The Clarysville Bridge, as seen in this photograph, was constructed in about 1843 as a single span stone arch structure which crosses Braddock Run. It is one of the original bridges on the National Road. An engineering marvel, the Hoffman drainage tunnel was constructed from 1903 to 1906. Its purpose was to handle the increasing amounts of water being generated by the expanding coal mining activity in the George's Creek Basin. Except for an 18 degree turn, the tunnel was dug in a straight line. It drained water from the mines by gravity flow. The two mile long Hoffman drainage tunnel was constructed at a cost of $300,000. The Allegheny Grove was located just west of present day Vokey Road down Campground Road south of Arby's Restaurant in LaVale. It was incorporated as a revival meeting site in 1890 and was served by two nearby local railroads as well as streetcars of the Cumberland and Westernport Electric Railway Company. The Grove was Allegheny County's foremost summer religious and Chautauqua center. It combined Christian fellowship, camp meetings, and summer recreation for the entire family. The site featured a tabernacle, 75 summer cottages, a smaller pavilion, and eventually a hotel. Its popularity attracted humorists, musicians, and such well-known persons as John Philip Sousa and Helen Keller. In April 1914, a fire destroyed the tabernacle and about 65 cottages. In 1918, the hotel was also destroyed by fire, and Allegheny Grove became but a memory. We're at the gravesite and memorial to the founders of Frostburg, Meshach and Catherine Frost, located here in the courtyard of St. Michael's Catholic Church in Frostburg. It was Meshach who built a home upon Lot 1, and it was to this site where he brought his wife Catherine shortly after their marriage in 1812. Upon Catherine's death, Meshach's remains were relocated from Mount Savage and reinterred by his wife's side in St. Michael's Catholic Cemetery. In November 1877, the founders of Frostburg were relocated to the courtyard of St. Michael's Catholic Church here in the heart of Frostburg. I felt this would be a good place to begin our historic tour of Frostburg sites. Frostburg. How they began it, I cannot say, but they started a path and it ran away till it climbed the hill at the mountain's feet and it grew from a path to a little street. Folger McKenzie of the Baltimore Sun visited Frostburg during the Frostburg homecoming in 1912 and wrote the poem from which these lines are taken. Frostburg can trace its history back to the very early 1800s when the community was known as Mount Pleasant and consisted of only three homes. 
By the time the National Road opened through in 1812, an early settler named Josiah Frost had laid off the town along its route and was offering building lots for sale. As the town grew, it became known as Frost Town after the 1812 founders, Meshach, Josiah's son, and Catherine Frost. Stagecoach service through the town by way of the National Road began in 1818, and after the first post office was established on May 1st, 1820, the current name of Frostburg came into being. The Hotel Gladstone was built in 1896 at a cost of $125,000 and opened for guests on New Year's Day, 1897. The Gladstone was considered the finest hotel in Maryland outside of Baltimore. It had 100 rooms, a cafe, barber shop, and an observatory on the fifth floor. The Gladstone later the Gunter, and now Phalanger's Hotel Gunter, became a major summer destination point on the National Road, and during World War I, provided free rooms to soldiers passing through Frostburg. The hotel has been restored in recent years. It presently boasts a fine restaurant, hotel rooms, historic tours of the basement jail, and cockfight arena. The original Bell School was located on East Loo, now College Avenue, and was first known in 1895 as Public School No. 1. It was later named Bell High School and had a large addition built in 1910. Bell became an elementary school upon the completion of the new and current Bell High School in 1940. It was finally raised in 1975 for a new elementary school which currently stands on this site. The new, current Bell High School was constructed in the years 1940-1941. It was designed in 1939 by Robert Holt Hitchens, the same man who designed the Cresset Town Elementary School and our present Allegheny County office building on Pershing Street in Cumberland. The Citizens National Bank of Frostburg was opened for business on June 29, 1893. In 1910, a new site was purchased where construction began on this modern two-story fireproof banking building. The new bank building opened about 1912 and featured a luxuriously appointed main banking room. In 1933, the Citizens National Bank went into receivership and a new bank, Frostburg National, opened at the same location in 1934. The site is now occupied by the First National Bank of Maryland. The First National Bank of Frostburg was organized in 1889. Between 1911 and 1912, the bank erected a new structure on the southeastern corner of Broadway and Main Streets. This handsome, three-story white marble building featured 12 solid white marble support columns, bronze doors, and wrought iron grills over the windows. The massive bank vault was considered impregnable. First National always prided itself on conservative management and safe and sane business dealings. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt declared a bank holiday, closing the banks for federal inspection. Those in good financial shape were permitted to reopen. The first National Bank of Frostburg remained closed. The Fidelity Savings Bank of Frostburg, depicted here in this 1908 view, was organized by Daniel and Hugh McMullen and opened on May 1, 1902, with Daniel McMullen as president. The railroad had reached Frostburg in 1852. 
and by 1857, the C&P Tunnel had been constructed at a length over 500 feet beneath Frostburg. The tunnel connected the Mount Savage and Cumberland and the Georges Creek Coal and Iron Company railroads between the points from Cumberland to Piedmont. These railroads merged in 1864 to form the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad. The Hill Street School was constructed in 1899. The public school, located at the corner of Hill and Oak Streets, originally consisted of six rooms, servicing about 300 students and a faculty of five with a teaching principal. A 1914 expansion provided two additional toilets, a recreation hall, second floor auditorium, and two or three extra classrooms. In 1976, the doors of Hill Street School closed. The site now houses the Frostburg Museum, where artifacts and displays depict Frostburg's rich mining, educational, and cultural heritage. The Zion United Church of Christ, located at 158 East Main Street, is the area's oldest church building. The structure was erected by the Frostburg English Lutheran Congregation. The cornerstone was laid on September 19, 1846, and actual construction took place between the years 1845-1846. When the new Lutheran Church was constructed in 1863 at the corner of Main and South Water Streets, the church property was deeded to the German Evangelical Lutheran Jothian Church. This was for the sum of $1,000 and occurred on July 22, 1865. Shortly after 1850, the Catholic Church purchased some property in the middle of town. The site was Highland Hall, the original homestead of Frostburg's founders, Meshach and Catherine Frost. After the purchase, portions were remodeled into the first St. Michael's Church, which as a parish came into formal existence in 1852. The present church was erected in 1868-1870. It once had the town's tallest spire, but was removed due to, as some would say, the potential danger caused by Frostburg's fierce winter winds. The rectory was completed in 1872 upon the original Highland Hall site. The school was built in 1891. In 1835, the first Methodist church was constructed on a parcel of land purchased for $100. This was on the site of the present Methodist church at 48 West Main Street. Between 1855 and 1856, the original small stone church was dismantled and replaced by a larger frame edifice. Work began on the current decorative Gothic style church in 1870. This was built at a cost of $42,237. The Frostburg United Methodist Church was dedicated on December 17, 1871. The red brick parsonage east of the church was completed in 1892 at a construction cost of only $4,000. The first English Baptist church was organized in 1871. In 1905, the present church building was constructed, and in 1907, a parsonage erected. This parsonage was used until the property, located at 130 East Main Street, was purchased for use as the parsonage. This parsonage, as viewed in this photograph, was demolished in 1973, and in 1974, the current parsonage, a split foyer brick home, was constructed. In 1931, extensive remodeling was done to the church building, giving its present appearance. 
St. Paul's Lutheran Church is the oldest established congregation in Frostburg. The Lutherans of Frostburg were organized by 1812. The congregation later met at various locations, including the present Zion United Church of Christ edifice. In 1859, they secured their present location at 34 West Main Street, whereupon a cornerstone was laid in July 1860 for a new church. This was the original church upon this site, and it was completed and dedicated in 1863. A major fire gutted this structure on September 5, 1874. On April 20th, 1879, the new church, essentially the present edifice, was completed and dedicated. The steeple was added in 1883. A proud boast of the Consolidation Coal Company was not only that they made Frostburg famous, but that they supplied the coal used in the ships of the United States Asiatic Squadron under the command of Commodore Dewey. These were the ships that defeated the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay during the Spanish-American War of 1898. Consolidation was a major employer and power in this county during the 19th century and well into the 20th. The Frost Mansion at 58 Frost Avenue was constructed in 1846 by the founders of Frostburg, Meshach and Catherine Frost. This elegant structure was initially surrounded by numerous outbuildings comprising the Frost Farm. Meshach died in 1863, Catherine in 1876. Their son Nathan served as Frostburg's first mayor in 1870. About 1884, Nathan established the former farmhouse as a summer hotel, attracting many important guests from the Baltimore and Washington areas. A description from 1888 notes the building had 17 rooms on three acres of ground. In 1905, John W. Shea located his pharmacy into this building one of the most finest and completely fitted pharmacies in the state. It was known as having the first tile floor laid down in the state of Maryland. In 1902, crowds gathered around the first streetcar in Frostburg. The Frostburg Company merged in 1905 with Westernport and the Cumberland Street Railway to form the Cumberland and Westernport Electric Railway Company which owned and operated a transportation network consisting of 28 miles of track. State Normal School No. 2 at Frostburg was established in 1898 by an act of the Maryland Legislature. The state provided $20,000 to erect the school, but it was the citizens themselves, many of whom were coal miners, who raised the funds and secured a school site. The first building erected was Old Main, which had its cornerstone laid on September 4, 1899. The school opened September 15, 1902, and graduated its first class of eight students in 1904. The school became known as Frostburg State Teachers College in 1934 and Frostburg State College in 1963. On July 7, 1987, the institution was granted university status. The Miners Hospital Bill appropriated $25,000 for the erection of a hospital in Frostburg. The hospital site was selected and furnished by the city of Frostburg. Construction began in 1912, and the hospital was officially opened on October 4, 1913, with a woman physician as the hospital's first superintendent. Miners Hospital had been the only general hospital funded by the state of Maryland. It is now known as Frostburg Community Hospital. The formal name Frostburg 
came into being with the official establishment of a post office on May 1st, 1820. The Frostburg postal system provided free mail delivery to its patrons, and in 1911, Frostburg had established the first postal savings bank in the state of Maryland. It was also about 1911 that Congress appropriated $50,000 for the purchase of a lot and erection of a new post office building. Located on the corner of Main and North Water Streets, the lot cost $10,000. This left $40,000 for the construction. The original main portion of the current Frostburg post office was built in 1912. The Dreamland, a Nickelodeon, opened as early as 1904 in the building now occupied by the Palace Theater at 33 East Main Street. The Palace Theater story began in 1911 when Adolph Fry, a local electrician, and the Spates brothers purchased the building and after extensive remodeling, incorporated the Palace Theater Company in 1912. Frostburg's Palace Theater held its grand opening on June 11, 1913, and it enjoyed wide notoriety. The Palace closed its doors as a movie theater in 1911. In recent years, it has served the community for local theatrical productions, civic events, and tours and activities. The Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad Depot was constructed in 1891. The depot served as a passenger and freight station en route between Cumberland and Piedmont. Passenger trains ran daily until 1942. Incorporated in 1850, the C&P was purchased by the Western Maryland Railway in 1944. In the early 1970s, the Western Maryland Agency at Frostburg was closed. The tracks removed and the depot abandoned by 1973. In May 1989, the old depot reopened as a restaurant in the Frostburg terminus of the Allegheny Central Railroad. Two views of East Main Street. The first from the famous snowfall of April 29th, 1928. Notice Dave Gunner's modern super service station. Another view further west, the June 10th, 1908 Firemen's Convention. As the back of one of these postcards states, the old town has turned herself loose. We're at the Morrison Cemetery, located deep within the heart of George's Creek, at the gravesite of the Reverend William Shaw. The Reverend William Shaw was born in Barton on Umber, England, in 1757. He came to America as a young man and located in the Cressop Town area. He was a Methodist minister and he traveled throughout Allegheny County ministering to the needs of the people. It is said the Reverend William Shaw built the first house in what is now Barton in about 1794. His son, Major William Shaw, served in the War of 1812 against England and soon settled after the war in the area known today as Western Port. The Major William Shaw owned large property holdings about four miles east of Western Port, and in 1853, he laid off 66 lots and established a town called Barton in honor of his father's birthplace, Barton on Umber. I felt this gravesite, the gravesite of Reverend William Shaw, 
would be a good place to start our George's Creek tour. A famed Delaware Indian guide, Nemec Colon, once had a son who he left as a ward in the care of Thomas Cressop. The youth was given the Christian name George, and the present-day Lonaconing Area Valley was his hunting domain, hence the name George's Creek. The name Lonaconing, according to some scholars, is a derivation from the Indian word Alakani and means the meeting place of many streams. Others say the town was named for a long ago Indian chief, Lonakona. Those settlers had come to the area in the latter part of the 18th century. It would not be until the 1830s when Lonakoning began its climb as a town and commercial center. This was due to the coming of the Georges Creek Coal and Iron Company, which constructed an iron furnace in 1837 for the manufacture of pig iron. The developing coal industry would, by the mid-19th century, begin seven decades of growth and prosperity for the hub of the creek, Lonaconing, as well as the other Georges Creek communities of Barton and Midland, where coal was king. The town of Lonaconing was incorporated in 1890. On August 13, 1905, ground was broken on a 250 by 400 foot parcel of land for the construction of the Klotz Throwing Company Silk Mill in Lonaconing. The citizens of Lonaconing themselves took $40,000 in bonds to ensure erection of the $60,000 building. During its first year in 1907, the mostly female employees were earning wages of $3.50 per week. The New York-based company also operated mills in Cumberland and Kaiser, West Virginia, where Japanese imported raw silk was processed into thread. The Lonaconing Silk Mill provided employment for up to 300 people prior to its final closing on July 7, 1957. The Lonaconing Glass Company was incorporated on May 21, 1914. The factory produced glasses, stemware, and jugs. The original factory burnt down in 1916, but was rebuilt in 1917. The factory closed in 1918, but was reopened two years later in 1920 under the name of the, the Utility Glass Company, which produced automobile lenses and tableware. The plant underwent reorganization and was then known as the Sloan Glass Company. On March 6, 1932, a major explosion and fire devastated the building. The plant, which employed 220 people, never reopened. The site of the Brady House was sold to James T. Brady in 1873. The original hotel was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1881, but was rebuilt again in the same year. This is the current Brady Hotel. Though the facade has changed somewhat, much of the interior, particularly the bar, remains unchanged. The Lonaconing Iron Furnace was constructed in 1837 by the George's Creek Coal and Iron Company with the first run of iron made on May 17, 1839. Between the years 1839 and 1844, the iron furnace was responsible for the employment of 260 workers. Nationally significant, this was the first iron furnace in America to successfully use coal and coke fuel rather than charcoal to produce pig iron. Castings included stoves, farm implements, and dowels for the Sino Canal lock walls. The Lonaconing Iron Furnace is 50 feet high and 50 feet square at the base, 
iron production ceased around 1855 due to imported iron and the growing profitability of the company's coal trade. An early one-room schoolhouse located at the corner of Jackson and Hanicamp Street. The site for Central School was purchased for $2 in 1889 by the Board of Allegheny County Commissioners from the Georges Creek Coal and Iron Company. The school was built during the years 1889-1890, and the first session of school began in September 1890. In 1895, Central was enlarged and made a high school, offering 11 years of education. And in 1902, a 12th grade was added to the curriculum. Central High School underwent several expansions. In 1911, six classrooms were added. And in 1919, an auditorium and four rooms added to the south end. In 1953, the high school closed and Central Elementary School opened in the former high school building. The school finally closed in 1975 and the building was raised shortly thereafter. Jackson School was constructed in 1893 primarily to relieve the overcrowding which was occurring at Central. A two-story brick building, Jackson boasted six classrooms and indoor plumbing, something the town was very proud of. The school served grades one through six and served the community until 1953. The current First United Methodist Church, a large frame structure known as the Church on the Hill, was dedicated on December 30th 1873 and built at a cost of $15,000. The church tower was constructed in 1921. From 1840 through 1866, Redemptorist priests from Cumberland serviced the Catholic community of Lonaconing, many of whom were Irish and attracted here by work in the iron and coal mines. The St. Mary of the Annunciation Church was constructed of wood and stone in 1865. A rectory and school soon followed, and in 1885, a convent was constructed to house the sisters, which staffed a parochial school which operated until 1907. Presbyterian activity in Lonaconing is documented as far back as 1853, but it would not be until 1861 that a church would be officially established. On November 17, 1867, the first Presbyterian Church of Lonaconing was dedicated at a construction cost of $3,000. The parsonage, built at a cost of $2,500, was completed in 1868, and in 1870, a bell was purchased for the sum of $300. Between 1893 and 1907, stained glass windows were added, an iron fence erected, and cement walks and steps laid to the church entrance. John Van Buskirk was an early settler who moved into the Lona Koenig area around the 1780s. In 1790, he built the Brummage Stone House. The house has stone walls 18 inches thick. It served as a Catholic chapel for circuit riding priests from St. Peter and Paul's Church in Cumberland. People would walk as much as five miles from Barton to attend services here. One particular Redemptorist priest who held masses here in 1843 would later become widely known as St. John Newman. The house has recently been renovated and is now a private residence. Bituminous coal had been discovered in what is now Allegheny County prior to the French and Indian War. At least three 18th century maps document coal in the Georges Creek region. 
Although local farmers worked small individual diggings prior to the 19th century, it would not be until about 1810 that the coal industry began to obtain some degree of commercial importance. The coal of George's Creek was prized for its steam producing qualities, was used in locomotives, steamboats, factories, and shipped all over the world. Employing thousands, coal reigned as king in George's Creek from about 1850 until 1910. From that point on, the industry began a gradual decline, primarily because of replacement fuels such as oil and gas. Labor shortages and union problems also caused the decline to occur. Surface mining totally replaced deep mining in the Crick in the early 1960s. A 1909 depiction of the Georges Creek Railroad Viaduct near Gilmore. Those are the tracks of the Cumberland and Westernport Electric Railway beneath the viaduct. In 1929, the Goodwill Fire Company of Lonaconing hosted the State Firemen's Convention. The Lonaconing Reservoir, perhaps also known as the Charleston Dam, was a popular swimming spot. Main Street, Midland, 1908. A 1906 view of the Ocean No. 8 mine opening at Midland. The famed Hotel Bowen in Midland, 1907. La Trobe Street in the heart of Barton, 1908. Though history books state that the town of Westernport was incorporated by an act of the Maryland legislature on February 23, 1859, official town and state records cite the year as 1858. The town was named Westernport because it was, for flatboats only, the westernmost navigable port on the Potomac River. The community was served by trolley cars of the Cumberland and Western Port Electric Railway. This company resulted from several mergers in 1905 and had 28 miles of track running from Cumberland through LaVale to Frostburg and down George's Creek to Western Port. As early as 1849, Redemptorist priests from Cumberland were ministering to the Western Port area Catholic population. Many of these residents were Irish and Italian immigrants who came to work in the coal mines of George's Creek. The first Catholic church in Westernport was built between 1854 and 1857 and used by the congregation until the opening of the present edifice in 1873. St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church had its cornerstone laid on April 16, 1871, and was built at a cost of $25,000. The Colonial Revival-style rectory was built about 1898. Work on the convent began in 1873, and the parish school was constructed in 1905. The First Baptist Church of Westernport as stated on the cornerstone, was erected in 1908. St. James Episcopal Church was built in 1878 to serve the growing population of Westernport, much of which resulted from the completion of the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad line, which was completed to Westernport during the 1860s. Located on Front Street in Westernport, the Mount Calvary Lutheran Church was originally constructed in 1876. In 1897, the church underwent a major remodeling. 
Although altered somewhat, much of the church retains its original construction and appearance. A 1917 view of the old Western Port High School, also referred to as the Hammond Street School. The Western Port Public School was constructed in 1891 and had Oliver H. Bruce as its principal. In 1912, this Western Port postcard depicted the new Washington Street Concrete Bridge. On May 19, 1950, opening ceremonies were conducted for the new Washington Street Iron Bridge. The Honorable George Kite, mayor of Westernport, presided with music provided by the Potomac Fire Company Band. Other notable Westernport scenes include the Dixon Building on Main Street, which sold men's clothing. The Reeves Medical Clinic, Main Street Western Port, and another view of Main Street and Western Port, and another wonderful depiction of Main Street featuring the Cumberland and Western Port electric railway car. And on the right, the old Citizens National Bank. This is now home to the first United National Bank and Trust. The town of Luke, Maryland was incorporated in March 1922. This building, constructed on ground donated by the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company, opened as the new Luke School in September 1913. Later additions included an auditorium. It was used for grade school and junior high students. In 1959, the school closed and the building was purchased by the town for use as a municipal building. West Vaco was founded on October 19, 1888 and was first known as the Piedmont Pulp and Paper Company of Allegheny County in West Piedmont, now Luke, Maryland. The first company president was William G. Luke, who had come from Scotland in 1852 and helped finance and establish the company. It was in 1889 that a small pulp mill began operation, and in 1891, the first two paper machines were installed and operated under the name of the West Virginia Paper Company. These companies merged with the West Virginia Pulp Company, which was organized in 1892 from nearby Davis, West Virginia. And in 1897, the operation became known as the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company. The current company name, West Vaco, came into being in March 1969. A close-up 1911 view of the old main office building of the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company. The building was demolished in the mid-1980s. The Devon Club of Luke was a well-known gathering and meeting place for residents of Luke and employees of the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company. The Devon Club featured a large auditorium which held stage shows, smokers, and card tournaments. The club also sponsored baseball teams in the area. One of the first managers of the Devon Club in 1912 was a gentleman named Tom Galloway. At the time this photograph was taken, about 1920, the manager was Frank Rocky Dixon. The building exists today and is still being used by the paper company to house the design engineering offices.
The sounds that you may hear are the cars and the trucks traveling east and west on Route 48, soon to be designated Interstate 68. Though located in Washington County, the Sidling Hill Cut is considered the eastern gateway to Allegheny County. Construction on this four and one half mile long, 360 foot deep portion of the National Freeway was begun on April 20th, 1983. Over 4.75 million cubic yards of material was removed prior to its dedication on August 15th, 1985. The final construction cost estimate was $20,795,000. The cut is a geological classroom. Fossilized plant and marine fragments go back 350 million years, and rock formations date from the Paleozoic era. The site was once a primordial sea, and Sidling Hill, now 1,700 feet high, possibly towered 29,000 feet. A geological exhibition center is scheduled for completion here in March 19. This view of Sidling Hill, though located in Washington County, is our gateway to historic general Allegheny County wide scenes and historic sites. Sent to capture the French stronghold of Fort Duquesne at the forks of the Ohio, General Braddock led his force of British regulars and colonial militia out of Fort Cumberland in 1755. Refusing to heed the advice of local frontiersmen to adapt to Indian methods of fighting in the wilderness, General Braddock's troops marched as if on parade. Banners flying, drummers playing, the British made slow progress. The French and Indians were waiting, firing from behind trees and rocks. They picked off the red-coated troops. Hemmed in by the forest, the British soldiers found their European battlefield tactics worthless. They were slaughtered. Braddock was mortally wounded and died during the retreat. His burial service was conducted by George Washington, a member of his staff. George Washington's last act in uniform as Commander-in-Chief of the Army was to review the troops assembled at Fort Cumberland in October of 1794 before they marched into Pennsylvania put to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. The suppression of this rebellion by Pennsylvania farmers against the federal whiskey tax was a crucial step for the new republic. The Corrigan Brick Tavern is located on the Old Plank Road, now Old Route 36, in Corriganville. Built in 1860, the tavern provided not only drink and accommodations to the traveler, but also served as a social center and post office for local citizens. Main Street in Ellerslie, 1914. A 1910 view of the old Ellerslie Public School. Known today as Mount Savage, this community was originally referred to as Arnold Settlement in about 1780 after the descendants of the Arnold family. They were among the earliest settlers who came to this area in the latter part of the 1700s and established themselves along an old Indian trail to the west, later known as Turkey Foot Road. The settlement served as an overnight stop for travelers moving westward to the Ohio River and is considered the county's oldest community wherein a group of families settled at the same time. Because of the area's rich mineral deposits such as coal, iron, and clay, a rolling mill was established in the town in 1839. And in 1844, the iron mill rolled the first iron railroad rail in America. The New York Iron and Coal Company called this iron works Mount Savage because of the operation's location at the foot of Savage Mountain. Iron and brick making, coal mining, and railroading characterized the historical development of Mount Savage. The first mass 
celebrated in the area known today as Mount Savage was in 1793 and conducted by Father Stephen T. Baden, the first priest ordained in America. Between 1829 and 1835, St. Ignatius Church was erected. The congregation outgrew this edifice, and on April 23, 1863, the cornerstone was laid for a new church. It was named St. Patrick in recognition of the predominance of Irish immigrants. St. Patrick's Catholic Church was formally dedicated on October 5, 1873. The new bell and church tower, which was surmounted by a massive gilt cross, was blessed by James Cardinal Gibbons in 1892. In 1869, nuns of the Ursuline Order arrived to establish a school for the parish children. Later replaced by the Sisters of Notre Dame, this parochial school was constructed in 1900 and served as St. Patrick's School until closing in 1969. The Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad was the county's most enduring short line. Built in 1844, the C&P was incorporated in 1850 and organized in 1853. Its Mount Savage shops employed as many as 600 men. This C&P office building was constructed in 1901 and served the Mount Savage shops. The shops closed upon the Western Maryland Railway's purchase of the C&P in 1944. By 1953, the C&P was merged into the Western Maryland system. The C&P Depot at Mount Savage, shown in this photograph, was constructed in 1891. In about 1869, Dr. Alexander Thompson, company doctor for the New York Iron and Coal Company, constructed a handsome stone residence in Mount Savage. This structure was purchased from Thompson's widow in 1909 by Andrew Ramsey. Ramsey, who was born in Scotland, doubly enlarged the magnificent stone structure and patterned it after Old Craig Castle in Scotland. The castle is now operated as a bed and breakfast and also provides tours by appointment. In 1895, Andrew Ramsey founded the Mount Savage Enamel Brick Company. Included among the items manufactured by Ramsey's Corporation were pottery, laboratory ware, and a magnificent ceramic glazed brick, the production secret of which died with Ramsey. Ramsey's bricks were world-renowned and used in the subways of New York, federal buildings in Washington, D.C., and office buildings throughout the Northeast. His other products, known for beauty and durability, were shipped all over the Western Hemisphere. Eventually, business setbacks, competition, and production problems forced the mortgaging of Ramsey's company in the late 1920s. Ramsey moved to Ohio and died there in 1932. Good, hard-working people have always characterized Eckert Mines. At the time of these photos, soft coal was the main source of income, due primarily because of the seams which outcropped in the town. The main companies operating in Eckert Mines were Consolidated Coal, Brophy's, and Sullivan Brothers. Washington Mine Number 2 at Eckert. Eckert Hill, 1907, just east of Frostburg. Having a fine time in the burg, writes Marguerite. The Junior Order of United American Mechanics Hall at Eckert. In 1924, America's most beautiful fairground, the Cumberland Fairgrounds, was completed and occupied at a cost of $250,000. 
built on a track of land along the Potomac River and beneath the towering cliffs of Knobbly Mountain, the track hosted horse racing, which was a popular attraction at Fairgo from the 1920s until the last horse race in September 1961. William Rhodes is shown preparing the fairgrounds for opening day, October 7, 1924. The Roberts School was built between 1873 and 1881 and was located in Bowling Green near the present Bowling Green Fire Hall and opposite Aspen Avenue. The photo, taken in 1921 during Prohibition, advertises Quino, a non-alcoholic beverage sold by the German Brewing Company. On July 4, 1828, President John Quincy Adams broke ground in Georgetown for the 184 and one half mile long Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. The final canal segment into Cumberland wasn't opened, however, until October 1850, 